In late August 1986 or possibly 87, I'm not sure which. I drove four friends up from Portland to the south side of Mount Hood to spend three days on the trail that goes round the mountain. We were all 17 or so, and there were two other couples and myself. On the second day, we had made it only to the east side of the mountain going clockwise. I think it was called Sherwood Camp. We found the campsite late and decided to set up on our own near a creek on the opposite side of the trail from the campground sign. A hundred yards or so off the trail in a fairly level open part of the forest. There was a creek nearby. There were huckleberries out and we set up our three tents close together. The next morning I got up about 5.30 but noticed from my tent flap the others had all slept in. Some movement about 70 feet away in the berry bushes and evergreens caught my eye. I saw a large light beige colored creature all covered with hair seven to eight feet tall. It's back to me, trying to reach something, a branch I guess, about 15 feet. Off the ground. Not more than 10 feet away was this other creature the same but small, all covered with hair except for the front of the hands, the bottoms of the feet and around the eyes. The second one was only about three feet high and was bending over picking up a stick which it was trying to put in its mouth. The little one was a bit darker in color, a dark beige. The hair on both was up to four inches long at most. The big one was really thick set. I could not make out any of the front of the hands, the bottoms of the feet and around the eyes. The second one was only about three feet high and was bending over picking up a stick which it was trying to put in its mouth. The little one was a bit darker in color, a dark beige. The hair on both was up to four inches long at most. The big one was really thick set. I could not make out any of the front of her, because she was turned away from me almost the whole time about a minute. I thought she was the little one's mother. She gave a kind of grunt at the little one like she didn't want him doing that, and he dropped the stick. At that moment I was on all fours leaning out of the tent, trying to see better, and my hand popped on a twig, and the big one looked right at me. But all she did for a second was grunt again at the little one, and she reached down, stepped over and took his hand. It was like she was motioning for him to go with her, and looked in my direction one more time, grunted softly again, and they were gone behind the trees. Their faces were like an ape around the lips and jaws, you know, their jaws jutted out a bit. Their heads weren't pointed, but I could see by the bare patches around the eyes and skin on the hands their skin was a kind of brownish gray. My friends never saw anything, but after we hitchhiked back to the jeep and were on the way out, I slowed down for a ranger, and he stopped to make sure we were okay. He was an older guy, I didn't get his name, he had gray hair and a bit of a paunch. He was a nice guy, he said this was his first season doing this, and when I told him what I had seen his eyebrows kind of went up. I didn't report this to anybody else. When I asked for other details, Kay added, well, when she walked away, she sort of waddled from side to side a bit. When I asked her about smell, she replied, nothing that I could tell. Did you look for tracks? No, I was a little scared. We just all got up and packed up after breakfast, and I didn't even want to go over there. All in all, it was a kind of scary but really fascinating thing. The whole thing couldn't have taken more than a minute, a minute and a half at most, but it seemed like five. The details really stuck in my mind. K. Told me there had been no alcohol or drugs and was sure of what she had seen. She said her friends died some time after that in a car crash, but that that ranger might remember. Around a week and a half ago, I was in Ocean City, New Jersey, and it was around midnight. I decided to take a stroll to the beach to enjoy a cigar and relax. As I gazed out over the ocean, I noticed something unusual 14 bright objects that looked like stars. These objects were perfectly round and resembled any other star you'd see in the night sky. However, they were all flying and dancing around each other in a mesmerizing display. Some of them flickered, while most emitted a steady bright light. These objects flew in curves and circles and at one point, they all converged closely before suddenly dispersing in all directions. I looked around hoping to find someone to ask about these mysterious objects, 
but there wasn't a single soul in sight. I stood there for over ten minutes, captivated by the silent performance in the sky. Their flight patterns resembled how gnats or bugs move, with no discernible order or pattern. These objects weren't like any known aircraft, not helicopters, airplanes, satellites, meteors, or comets. One of them caught my attention when it flew towards the horizon, turned around, and rapidly approached me. It passed right by, flying westward over the beach, the ocean city strip, and finally disappeared into the bay far out to the west. The speed and maneuverability of these objects left me in awe. I contemplated going back to my house to fetch my phone and return to the beach to capture this extraordinary sight, but I feared they might be gone by then. The round trip would have taken too long, and I didn't want to miss anything. The next day, curious to see if anyone else had witnessed the same thing, I searched on YouTube and looked for articles about Ocean City UFO, but to my surprise there was nothing. No videos, no articles, it seemed like nobody else had seen what I had experienced. This is the first time I've shared this encounter. While I hesitate to claim that these objects were aliens, they were undoubtedly UFOs to me simply unidentified flying objects, as I couldn't determine their origin or nature. It remains a mystery, and I still have no idea what they were. It was the strangest and most awe-inspiring sight I've ever witnessed in my life. At the age of 11, my family moved to a large two-story house that overlooked some foothills about 30 miles west of Mount Rainier. Around 2011, I started seeing strange things there. In one instance, I was watching late-night TV with my mom and had my attention caught by what looked like a really bright star in the east by the mountain. I stared at it for about three minutes before the star suddenly dropped straight down into the foothills. I stood up and shouted, scaring my mom. She didn't believe me, but I know what I saw. The second most bizarre occurrences happened after my girlfriend at the time moved in with my family. On three separate occasions, my girlfriend and I were startled by incredibly bright flashes of light in the dead of night that illuminated every corner of whatever room we were in at the time. Almost like a camera flash or a lightning strike. The only thing is, we were on the second floor of the house every time, and there were no trees or roofing near any of the windows that would have allowed someone to take a photo without a ladder. But there was nothing when I'd rush over to the windows. They also only happened on hot summer nights where there wasn't a single cloud in the sky, which rules out the possibility of lightning. We both saw the flashes every time and could never rationalize what they could have been. I do some solo rock climbing on Yosemite big walls from time to time. It's not free solo the ropeless slip and dive version, as I'm still roped in and have various safety systems in place, but it's still damned unsettling to be on cliffs alone. Last fall I solid a 1E300 feet route on the Washington column called the Prow. It took me three days. The first night was horrific because a severe thunderstorm rolled in. I spent the entire night shivering wide awake 500 feet off the ground as the heavens were rent asunder all around my portal edge. That was downright terrifying especially considering that I was a bit of a lightning rod with all of my aluminum equipment. After I descended two days later, some hikers I bumped into mentioned that they had seen lightning strike the top of the Washington column that night. But the most eerie thing I've ever experienced was the whiteout. Between the thunderstorms and pouring rain on the first and second days, the fog would roll in and start to thicken. At its worst, visibility dropped to 15 feet. On the ground that qualifies as more than creepy, 500 feet up a vertical granite face and totally alone, it is disorienting and nightmarish. I could see 15 feet up, left and right, before the rest of the granite faded into the fog. But the worst was looking down into a white abyss. Not seeing another human for three days was weird, but not seeing the ground for several hours scared the bloody shit out of me. Your world condenses to a tiny bubble, and there is nothing to orient you in space but gravity. The closest thing I could compare it to is closing your eyes and floating underwater. It's that level of sensory deprivation, 
but with the horrifying knowledge that you were utterly alone and isolated. I had similarly terrifying experience the previous year on a solo ascent of the West Face route on Yosemite's Leaning Tower. It's a 900 feet route that consistently overhangs 10-15 degrees. On the second day, I was behind schedule and was finishing the last bit of climbing in the dark. The very last thing I had to do was ascend a fixed rope attached to my camp about a 100 feet above me. Ascending the rope involves using clamps that cinch on the rope and allow me to pull myself up the rope only, without needing to use the rock face itself. However, the rope hung vertically, and with the overhang of the face, I was about 20-25 feet from the cliff. I had my headlamp on and made the mistake of looking down to see. Nothing. Not a damn thing. There was just a black pit below me, as I was too high for my headlamp to illuminate the ground. It was like seeing the blackness of space, except beneath you and with no stars. Just like the whiteout on the Washington column, not being able to see ground is a really disconcerting and disorienting feeling. I noped the F out of there pretty quickly and spent a fairly pleasant night 50 feet from the summit before descending the next day. I was in Alaska studying dormant volcanoes as a field geologist, and most of these trips consisted of 30-day solo excursions with a sample drop-off every week or two depending on how remote the survey is. I'll never forget on my 26th day, hundreds of miles from any sign of man, and as I descended the mount walking maybe a mile off was a man, so naturally I gave the universal greeting of holding my whiskey flask into the air as high as I could hoping he would see the sun glimmer coming from it. And indeed he did. My solidarity had probably gotten the best of me considering I hadn't spoken to anyone else for weeks, and I probably shouldn't have approached him, but I was so lonely. He raised his rifle as we got closer, and made me dump my rucksack before he lowered it. From the contents that poured out it appeared he was interested in trade. I followed him back to his camp, which later I realized was his home. It was a shanty wooden hut in the middle of the woods. I realized he had been there for years. He had a rain barrel and no electricity, with multiple animal hides drying out in the sun. He descended upon my whiskey stash, and soon I had given him all my salt, pepper, Tabasco, and just about any other flavoring I had brought with me. He was fascinated by a small solar panel I used to charge my GPS and phone. He had been in the wilderness so long that the panel only became commonplace after he went off the grid. He had never heard what 9-11 was. Halfway through our meeting, I realized he had a motive behind speaking to me. He had seen me gathering samples the days before, and was worried my company was in the exploration phase of mining. I explained to him that wasn't the case, and I was representative from the government verifying the volcanoes were classified as dormant correctly. Immediately his demeanor changed, and he grabbed his nearest rifle forcing me to leave because I said I work with the government. In hindsight, I should have understood a man like this had very little care for government. He walked me a few miles away and told me never to come back and tell my boss the same. I promptly moved on to a new section of my map and marked are the features in the area around his hut as classified correctly. When I was about 12 or 13 my mom, two sisters, brother and I were driving home from a nearby very small town at about 2 a.m., a commute that we often made to see family who lived there. The drive to and from was only about two to three hours depending on traffic. However, since it is desert landscape with nothing but flat cracking sand and a few scattered succulent plants, it could often feel much longer. Because it was dark, we didn't even have that to look at. We resorted to playing different road trip games to pass the time we were all too young at the time to have any entertaining technology and to keep my mom awake as she had trouble driving at night. After driving for roughly an hour and a half, we crested over a hill where we could see the next larger city in the distance, the city's lights making the overhead clouds glow, and the moon sitting low in the horizon to the right where the clouds tapered off a bit. At this point we were all completely engulfed in our game, until suddenly an insanely bright and basically blinding green flash lit the horizon, looking like it burned hot white towards the middle. 
When I say green though I don't mean a green like normal green, I mean a weird, almost toxic and yellowish looking color, but still astonishingly bright. It lit the horizon from end to end as far as we could see, and then disappeared as if being sucked away just as swiftly as it appeared, like when someone covers a light source with their hand. At the same time it disappeared, every single light in the city we could see in the distance shut off at once, like a snap of someone's fingers. This scared me because I had seen power outages and usually they go grid by grid, not all suddenly together. The weirder thing was that the headlights to the car turned off as well, but not the car itself. My mom pretended not to freak out for the sake of us, but as the oldest I could tell she was genuinely scared. We kept driving for maybe a minute and a half before everything just popped back on again like someone plugged everything back in again, not grid by grid like I'm used to. I researched later the next day to see what it could be and saw the green flash phenomenon, but saw that that usually only occurs at sunset. Also tried to see if it could be some sort of power plant thing, but it wasn't that either. Still don't know what it was or what could have caused it as we were nowhere near a military base or testing ranges of any sort. I used to live in a quiet, remote village nestled among the picturesque landscapes of Sweden, about 40 kilometers northwest of Kirping. It was the kind of place where everyone knew each other, and life moved at a pace that was more attuned to the rhythm of nature than the hustle and bustle of city life. Our village consisted of no more than 10 houses, creating a close-knit community where everyone looked out for one another. One summer day when I was around eight years old, the sun was shining brightly in the sky, casting a warm glow over the lush countryside. I was out biking with a couple of my adventurous friends, eager to explore the outskirts of our village. Our destination was the old, abandoned train station that stood as a relic of times gone by. It had an air of mystery around it, a place where imagination could run wild with tales of the past. As we pedaled closer to the train station, the sense of curiosity mixed with a hint of trepidation. We were about 40 meters away when something caught my attention, a glimpse through a second floor window. There, standing in stark contrast to the surrounding decay and desolation, was a black figure. It felt as if its eyes were piercing through the distance, fixing directly on me. I couldn't help but gasp and point, my voice tinged with a mix of astonishment and unease. Look, do you see that? I asked my friends, my voice quivering slightly. They turned their gazes toward the window, their eyes widening in pure terror. Their silence spoke volumes, and I could tell they had seen it too. The figure stood there, shrouded in darkness, an enigma against the fading light of day. We didn't exchange any words, but the unspoken understanding hung heavily in the air we needed to get out of there and fast. Adrenaline surged through our veins as we abandoned our bikes and ran, our hearts pounding in our chests. Fear lent wings to our feet, and we didn't stop until we were back in the heart of the village, panting and trembling. It was a feeling I will never forget the primal fear that had gripped us, the sensation that we had encountered something beyond our understanding. We gathered in hushed whispers, recounting what we had seen and experienced, our young minds struggling to process the inexplicable. Over the years, the memory of that encounter never faded. Doubts crept and had it been a trick of the imagination, a result of our youthful curiosity running wild. But as I grew older, my conviction remained steadfast. To this day, I firmly believe that what I saw in that second floor window was real, a glimpse into a realm beyond our comprehension. Perhaps it was the spirit of a long lost soul lingering in the shadows of that abandoned train station, or maybe it was something else entirely. Whatever it was, that moment ignited a fascination with the unknown, a curiosity about the mysteries that lie beneath the surface of our world. The small village and that abandoned train station hold a special place in my heart, forever linked to that summer day when innocence collided with the inexplicable. And while time may have passed and life may have taken me on different paths, the memory of that black figure remains etched in my mind, a reminder that the world is full of wonders some visible, some hidden, and some that only a few are fortunate enough to glimpse.
My dad and I went on a hunting trip in upstate New York, where it's common to see a bear or two. We visited a reserve, explored lakes and outposts, and overall, it was fun. However, while in one of the towers, we spotted a furry thing about 200 yards away in the trees and bushes. Hunters aren't allowed to shoot off the outpost, so we didn't think much of it at the time. Later, when we set up camp, we heard footsteps around the tent. I didn't pay much attention, assuming it was a deer or a squirrel, and went back to sleep. But it started getting weirder, with heavier and faster circling footsteps. I woke my dad, and we both went outside in our boxers with our guns. However, we couldn't see anything, and the noise stopped. Thinking I was going mental, I apologized to my dad, and we went back to bed. The next day, as we continued our journey, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I felt unsettled, but my dad didn't notice anything off. We set up camp again and saw the hairy thing once more. We watched it for a while until it disappeared, and we went to bed. But an hour or two later, we heard something different heavier, faster footsteps that sounded like multiple beings. Panic set in, and I woke my dad up. We both grabbed our guns and my dad went outside, shining his flashlight and yelling to scare off whatever was there. I was terrified and had tears in my eyes. We decided to leave immediately, packed up the tent, and started our hike back to the truck. During the hike, we heard knocking sounds all around us, making us even more anxious. We half jogged towards the truck, but my dad couldn't run due to a knee injury. At this point, I was on high alert, ready for anything with my gun in hand, fueled by adrenaline. As soon as we saw the truck, a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, making us run even faster. We drove to the nearest ranger outpost and reported the incident. The rangers mentioned similar reports, and my dad briefly described what he saw a seven-eight feet tall creature with a human face and a hairy body. He said there were four of them, but he doesn't like to talk about it often. Sorry for the long story. We were in Wales in 1992 for training exercises that we were to spend the night in the woods on the outskirts of a small town, then head into town for some R&R. As usual, we were eating field rations and had just broken out onto our sleeping bags for the night, and we heard something large moving throughout the woods. A few of the guys from my platoon grabbed their rifles and went to investigate. A minute or two later, the most awful sound I'd ever heard came from the woods. It sounded like somebody trying to scream while being strangled, maybe 50 yards away at most. It wasn't human nor animal in nature, but it was loud. To this day, I struggle to find the words to describe it. It shook me up. A few minutes later, the guys came back from checking out the woods. They did not have a clue what it was. One guy swore he saw something weird but he was also pretty shaken up too. We just need to forget about it, and I said, we can't just forget about it. I don't know what it was, but there's a chance it was a person. We need to go make sure. The guy who looked just seemed shaken and pale told me, it was no person, I'm telling you. Whoever it was, they're long gone by now. Well, I'm not just gonna sit here and do nothing, I told them. If you guys are too scared to go back there, then I'll go check it out. At this, a few of the guys who had gone into the woods shook their heads, but most of them just stared at the ground. I'm going to go back there, I told them. So one of my friends who was with me in the platoon told me he would come with me, even though he did have a lack of enthusiasm. The rest of the platoon was less reluctant, and so we all headed back there, minus a few guys, of course. We were not successful. Nothing was found, but we felt like we weren't alone out there in the wilderness. Anyway, that's my story. Haven't experienced anything else in the military quite like it. My husband, myself, and our 11-month-old baby were spending the weekend at the Oregon coast. We stayed one night and on the second day decided to just watch the sunset and head back home to Hood River after we ate dinner. It was pretty late by the time we reached Multnomah Falls exit, and my husband needed to take a break from driving to get some fresh air. 
We pulled into the parking lot and there were no other cars at all. We parked our vehicle at the west end of the lower parking lot. Our baby was sleeping in the back seat and he and I got out of the vehicle to stretch our legs and get some air. It was a pleasantly warm evening and very clear out. Just a few minutes had passed when all of a sudden we heard noise coming from the east end of the lot. We both looked and saw a very large, tall creature coming out of the tunnel where during the day people are walking in and out of constantly. It had to duck down to come through and seemed a bit irritated to have to do so. It came out of the tunnel and stood up tall pivoting to the west and headed our direction. During this entire ordeal, my husband now acts and I never spoke a word. Our voices fell silent as we both watched this thing head our way. As it came closer my mind tried to decide what it was. It clearly was not a human too tall to be that. It was not a bear as its arms were long and actually hung to around its knees at a full stand. It was not a gorilla as it walked like a human and was too big to be a gorilla. Process of elimination led me to the only logical conclusion. It was Bigfoot. Without a doubt. It was dead silent. You could have heard a pin drop. Wouldn't rational people jump into their vehicle where their precious child was sleeping and take the hell off? Well, to this day, I can't explain the fact that we both seemed frozen on our feet and could not move or speak. At this time, I recall there was no fear. Absolutely none. Anyway, it approached, and as it walked by us about 20 feet from where we stood, it stopped for just a moment, analyzed us by turning its head to look and made a sound, and a slightly irritated wave of its right arm. It then quickly lost interest and continued on its way heading west in the parking lot. We watched in silence as this huge and obviously dark and hairy creature walked up to a cement wall firmly planted its hands on the wall and oh so quickly swept its feet and legs right on through as it vanished into the dense forest beyond. Then it was gone. This entire incident lasted only minutes I am sure, but living it seemed to be in slow motion. Once the creature hopped the wall my husband and I finally looked at each other wide-eyed. All that he said at that moment was, let's get the hell out of here, as we got into our vehicle and took off. It wasn't until this moment that I felt physical fear. I began to tremble uncontrollably. My heart was racing at what we had just witnessed. We drove still in silence for a few minutes, and then it seemed that we both at the same moment said to each other, Did you see what I just saw? It was as if we had to confirm it with the other because it was so unbelievable. Yes, we had indeed both seen the same thing, thank God. No one would believe this story. He believed me, and I believed him. He also told me that he had no fear until it was gone, just like me. Not once did we feel threatened by it, though it seemed a bit irritated by something or did we fear for our sleeping baby in the back seat. Figure that one out. That's my story. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for giving me a chance to share it. When I was attending a university about seven years ago, I found myself in a situation that would forever change how I conducted myself outdoors. When classes got out one January afternoon, the county I was in was hit with an intense blizzard. While it was pretty typical to get snowstorms every week in the winter months in that area, this one lasted a good few days, and we got so much snow that the school gave everyone a heads up that classes would be canceled on Monday and Tuesday at least due to predictions of the storm lasting clear until Sunday night. My roommates and I decided we would get our homework done early so that we could spend the weekend exploring some of the thick woods surrounding the campus. Why would 320-somethings be exploring the woods in three feet of snow, let alone howling winds and freezing temperatures? Well, even I think this sounds ridiculous, looking back on it as in grown men. You see, my college was known for its various arts programs that produced a number of gifted writers, painters, and actors. Over the years, many students fabricated stories and false accounts of various bizarre happenings in those woods, ranging from Bigfoot sightings to ghosts and coven activities. We thought the snow would make for an interesting investigatory experience, so to speak. I figured that if there was indeed some supernatural phenomena going on in the woods, 
we would see things like disturbances in the snow and the natural silence of almost no one being outside in the winter terrain meant that we would hear all sorts of strange noises with no commotion to obscure them. I was generally the reasoner of my group, so no one argued with me. We packed some basic supplies into one of my hiking packs and left just a few minutes shy of noon. Long story short, we accessed the woods from a little-known entrance about 50 meters from the parking lot behind the Liberal Arts Lecture Building and hiked about two kilometers into the woods. The scenery was stunningly gorgeous, with the evergreen pines and invasive maple trees saturated with white dusting and snow covering every inch of the forest floor, sometimes high enough to completely conceal the underlying shrubbery. Despite this, the area was rather unspectacular, with only the odd squirrel hopping about and complete silence. Eventually, we decided to hike down to a shallow stream that students referred to as Flinger Creek, so nicknamed for the many students and local residents who would fly fish for brook trout in it during the spring months. There were lots of large rocks along the bank, so we thought we would, you know, roll a couple Northwest Delights and chill there for a bit. Well, we spread an old sheet full of holes and awkward stains on the ground and took our seats, joking about our butts being soaked with freezing snow water and even colder stones digging into our nethers as we tried to keep our hands from trembling as we rolled our smokes. Suddenly, a dense fog consumed the ravine, and it became hard to see anything further than around a dozen meters from either direction of our blanket. While this happened quite fast, it wasn't exactly unusual to us. After all, we were next to a river, with snow piling up above the embankments, so it only made sense that we would get some fog. After a few remarks, we brushed it off and began to toke up. Afterwards, the fog seemed even thicker than before, and as it was nearing three o'clock in the afternoon by this point, we decided to head back before the sun would begin to set thus, dropping the temperature and running the risk of our soaking pants freezing to our junk. We balled up the sheet, put it back in the backpack, and began to head back. Well, we got lost. We used a fallen tree as a trail marker on the way down to the river, but we actually walked past a tree that happened to have also fallen a few dozen strides from the one we noted. In the spring, this would not have been a big deal, but given the sheer amount of snow everywhere, combined with the fog, we could not really tell which way we were headed. My friends started to bicker amongst themselves while I attempted to get us out of there. Eventually, I decided I needed a cigarette to relax and regain focus, especially given that it was now nearly four o'clock and the sun was beginning to set. I stepped under a tree and upon sparking my Zippo, I noticed that the tree I was under had a bunch of weird hieroglyphs and runes carved into its bark. A lot of times students would do this to trick hikers into thinking they were near some witch or ancient monster in order to scare them for fun. I didn't really pay much mind to this until I heard some footsteps picking up from all around the tree. I called out, go F yourself, thinking it was one of my friends trying to scare me. I'm a pretty jumpy guy, honestly. At once, they all called out in protest. They, in fact, seemed to be under a tree several paces in front of me, where they remained since I broke away to smoke. I felt a chill not from the cold weather before replying. I heard someone stepping around. It was probably a deer or something. They made a joke about Bambi stalking me and laughed before they fell silent with an eerie promptness. I'm almost done with this guy, I called out, motioning to crush the cigarette, but in the snow, before I was halted by one of my friends via a quite drawn out, SHH. Wait. I got that same chill again. I remained faithful, quietly standing there as if waiting for the infantryman to give the signal to push on. I then heard another step. This time, it was a little heavier, like a foot intentionally pushing all the way through the snow to meet the frozen ground underneath. A moment later, I heard the sound of rapid footsteps go straight past me, picking up in speed as they grew audibly fainter. Jeremy screamed an obscenity I can't quite recall as the other guys shuffled in the snow suddenly, as if they were startled. Bear in mind, I could not see them from where I was. But I sprinted ahead whether in diligence or stupidity. I cannot remember until I tripped over one of them, who was on all fours struggling to get up. What on earth? 
I shouted as my comrades shuffled around and got their bearings. I could now see them clearly, and I almost laughed at the sight of powder snow all over their bodies, looking as if they got 86 from a trashy club in. 1986. They were all fumbling their words, which didn't seem to improve, even as all of us returned to upright positions. Then, Ron, arguably the most confident and bravest of us, straightened his glasses, sighed, and spoke. I don't know what it was, but something big walked right in your direction. Well, what did it look like? I muttered. Hell if I know. I could barely see the spark of your cancer stick in this fog. All I could tell was that it was dark colored, almost like a shadow, and that it was taller than us. He waved his hand frantically over his head, as if to remind me that he was indeed the tallest of us, and he was at least six feet and was moving your way. It was nuts. I immediately approached this from my usual philosophical perspective. It was probably a moose. We're not supposed to get them this early in the year down here. But hey, my uncle told me about a grizzly bear on his property last summer, and he lives supposedly 200 miles away from grizzly territory. Everyone groaned and sighed in silent agreement that this was probably some big animal, startled by our sudden screaming. At any rate, it was long gone, and we decided to use a compass app on my Android to get to some road that we could then follow back to campus. After about a half hour of walking in the opposite direction, we wound up just to the left of where we entered the woods. We shouted in celebration before heading back to our dorm. Later that night, just shy of midnight, I stepped out of the residence hall to have another smoke. My joints were a little stiff, so I decided to take a stroll. Like an unsung hero revisiting an old battleground, I walked back to the trailhead we took earlier, looking down it as the shadowy path now looked to be the throat of some great animal descending into nothingness as in an almost graceful void. I sighed and turned around to head back. My heart skipped a beat and I was speechless. I could not move or scream. Only inhale sharply as I witnessed the most terrifying thing I had ever seen. Towering in front of me at least ten feet tall was a being as dark as oil, with a long and twisting neck, extending upward and then curling back down in a supernatural arc cradling a small, oblong skull with a wide, gaping mouth, bearing a bottom row of flat teeth and a strange, bony appendage just below what appeared to be a blunted nose, pushed into its face, and two beady yet bright silver eyes spaced far apart and sitting on either side of that skull. I could make out no further features of this thing only that, right in the center of its awful, somewhat feathery torso which seemed surreal and featureless, it held a head bearing a stark resemblance to mine close to its chest if it had one. My eyes slowly rolled up to meet this thing's before I fell to the ground, laughing maniacally as snow swirled around us. So me and my friend you'll name them Red went down to a bridge that was over a river. The area was pretty shaded and trees was covering the bridge. Red and I were hanging out there and we heard a noise. At first we didn't think anything of it. Then we heard another noise and Red started running. I followed them. While we were running, I heard rustling to my left and something told me to run faster. So when I ran faster, Red looked behind me and they saw a 6FT guy with no face standing behind me. It was in the shade. He was wearing a white sweater with blue jeans. Anyway, we got to my TV and we turned around and saw it walking the opposite way. It wasn't walking normal, it was walking like an NPC. It turned the corner on the bridge and disappeared. We got super scared and I tried to start the ATV, but it somehow got stuck in the gravel. It was so stuck we had to have help by a random stranger. We eventually got home, but later we decided to go to a cemetery at night. The cemetery wasn't even a mile away from the bridge. I had another friend come over, I'll name them Blue, and we drove over to the cemetery. Once we pulled into the cemetery, everything was just gray, and the sun had just barely went down. I saw some cloud of smoke right across from me, and I had the urge to go further into the cemetery. All of the sudden, I just pressed the gas W my hand, and when I drove past the cemetery, I felt this feeling of determination, and I had this thought that wasn't mine, and it was... I have to save them, 
and I stopped at a corner and I looked to my left and I saw a cloud of dark smoke, and I remember having this thought that wasn't mine, and it was, it's hunting us. After that my head went back and my body was shaking and gagging. Then I just suddenly pressed on the gas with my hand and I flew around the corner. My hand was stuck and I couldn't move it from the position of being on the gas button. I pulled over and showed my friends my hand. I could barely pull it away and it was shaking, it hurt a lot. So I said, someone take over I can't drive anymore. And I got up to switch with red. But my body was thrown down and I passed the gas button to drive. Blue was praying while we were at the cemetery and they got punched in the gut and they felt like throwing up. So they were leaned over while I was driving home and Red had a clear shot of me. Mind you, they let go of the ATV and pulled their knife out. Eventually we got home and Red was acting strange. So we went to my basement and me and Blue started to sage Red. But they didn't like it. Also Red was staring at me and smiling the entire time so I saw them reach into their pocket, and then they stood up. I looked away for a second, and their knife was halfway open, and they were staring at me. So I immediately took their knife away, and I was smoke cleansing red and saying, whatever has attached to red's body will be gone, and I was whispering barley audible words. I opened my eyes and red started chuckling at me. It didn't sound like their normal laugh, so I got my friend, and we put a blessing on her to get that out of her. And we both still feel called to go back to the place. What do we do? A few friends and I went on an overnight hike in the Rockies behind our little town. A few years back when I was in HS, our camping site was pretty far up there and it was getting dark. The spot we were at was nestled in a grove of trees secluded from the wind and elements so we decided to stop there for the night. The four of us built a little fire and ate dinner, then just talked for a few hours. Then all of the sudden my friend leaps forward and douses the fire with our emergency water plunging us into complete darkness. Needless to say the rest of us were pretty pissed, as there was no reason for him to do this. He quickly shushes us, and we realize he is absolutely terrified. Like so scared he couldn't even speak or move. The rest of us managed to get a few word out of him, and he tells us to look up on the ridge where we should have been camping at. It was pretty far up, so it was kind of hard to see at first, but that sight will haunt me for the rest of my life. There was a fire, a big one, like a bonfire sort of thing. Around the fire were several figures moving in a slow circle. They were humanoid, but not quite, and in they had arms and legs like people but something just seemed different about them that I can't really explain. Almost like the limbs were too long and skinny or something, but maybe not. Anyway, these figures just moved around the fire in a really slow circle over and over again. My one friend claims he could hear them singing something, but I don't remember anything. Importantly, there was one standing off to the side a little ways leaning with his arm on a tree branch above his head. It really creeped us out but we were able to sleep it off. We figured it was a scout troop having a camp or something. Morning came and we finished off our hike to the peak and on our way down, we passed the place we saw the figures and decided to check out the camp. It was completely deserted. It was obvious that there had been a fire and there were footprints everywhere. Inside the fire pit was a small mound of charred animal bones, probably chipmunk and a pile of four or five rodent skulls that had been burned. Creepy, right? Then we look over at where the one figure was standing. Blood. Not a lot, but enough to be of concern or anything, but enough to be creepy. Then we see the tree branch he was casually leaning against. It was well over any of our heads, and I'm over six foot. That would mean that in order for the figure to lean against it like he was, he would need to be at least seven feet tall. Needless to say, we got off that mountain very fast, and I have never been up there again. We called the fish and wildlife rangers and told them what we saw. They said it was probably just a bunch of kids messing around and not to worry about it. It might have been just that, and we let our imaginations run wild, but all four of us swear to this day we all saw the same thing, and it didn't look like a bunch of kids in the dark. I don't believe in ghosts or the supernatural, 
but those mountains still scare the shit out of me, and I will never go back there again. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.